Well, I am so happy to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Drew Crooks is a longtime local historian. Make you sound old that way by saying that. But uh, he's a, got a passion for a, a part of our local history that not everybody knows about, and that's historic artwork. Uh, he's become an expert on artist Edward Lang, for example, and he also has authored a book about Lang that he has with him today for sale in the back table after the talk's over. And uh, Drew also finds art in areas that we don't often consider, and he'll be sharing with us today about local art in the form of business letterhead. So let's have a warm Schmidt House welcome for Drew Crook. Well, I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, one year ago, almost, roughly, uh, I was hoping to do this talk. I got sick for a long period of time. I'm doing much better now, but uh, I'm just, I, I'm amazed I'm still here. So uh, I, I, uh, thank you for coming today. And uh, my thanks also to, to Don, who organizes the Smith House Talks. And, he, and who kindly rescheduled me too? I'm very patient, to, to wait a whole year, you know. Um, and also my thanks go to Karen Johnson, the the uh, archivist here at the Smith House, because over the last couple of years she found a number of really interesting letterheads that she shared with me um, that are, are actually part of this talk today. Well, at least some of them are. Um, my thanks go to. The, the patient staffs at the Washington State Archives and the Washington State Library that saw me come year, a week after week for, for months looking at letterheads. And I know some of them must think I was insane, and perhaps I am, but um, they, they, they kindly brought the boxes out for me and, and let me look through them. Um, I also would like to thank my family uh, for their patience and support through the, these kind of long years sometimes. Um, uh, through thick and thin, supporting my historical research. Uh, if anyone wants to sit up closer, they're, they're welcome to, too. I know sometimes you like the seats back there. But um, why, why letterhead? I mean, that's a very strange topic, particularly in today's society when letterhead is, is basically um, going out of style, you know, replaced by the email, other electronic forms of communication. Why letterhead? Well. A number of years ago, uh, I got interested in the artist Edward Lang. And he was a local Olympia artist, active here from 1889 to 1912. And his art was what you would call popular art, commercial art. Uh, it was used to sell things, promote things. And I thought, wow, that is a way of understanding the past. Looking at the dreams and aspirations of people as expressed through artwork. And then I, I got from Lang, I went into bird's eye views. And these are the views of communities that, um, that artists drew, like up in the sky, looking down on a whole community, and they draw a panoramic view. And I, those were really interesting. And so I traced them from the, what I would call the classic 19th century uh, views up into the 1920s and 30s, in which they're called pictorial maps. Some are humorous, even. Um, and, and then I, 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 I was looking at a, certain things inspired me. I looked at illustrated letterheads. When I'm doing research on something, I go, wow, that is a neat letterhead. And uh, it kind of expresses that time, that business, that individual. And so for the last several years, I've been looking at letterheads. Um, I probably have gone through 10,000 letters. and. Um, uh, from the letterheads, what I do is I, I, if I find one interesting, I make a photocopy. So I don't have a, my own collection. I wish I did sometimes, but no, I don't have my own collection. I do, I do photocopies and then scans of the most interesting one. And um, from those, um, I've picked the, the best ones, I think, for, for Thurston County today. <laughs> Now, um, and during my research, I, I studied both all of Washington State. So I have letterheads from all different places in Washington, sometimes even the Pacific Northwest. And one time I found one of Munich, Germany that I just had to copy, so. But that, that's not today. Um, but uh, today is specializing on Thurston County. And um, because it's our home county. And there's some really intriguing letterhead designs from Thurston County. Um, 
Letterheads in this area developed slowly at first. Many pioneers did not have letterheads, illustrated letterheads. They, they couldn't afford it. They didn't have time or the money to resources to do it. It only was later in the 19th century that letterheads, illustrated letterheads took off. And in fact, to me, the golden age is the 1890s. But they continued up through time. And uh, it's because of the more people, more business, and more printing facilities. And the one thing I like about letterheads is that they have a definite message. And the message is whatever group did the letterhead, they want people to know they're respectable, they're dependable, um, and particularly pay attention to us. They're trying to catch your eye. And the last thing, and probably the most important on the bottom line, is do business with us. You know, so the letterheads have a definite message to the to people. Now, I would like to say that every letter I came across, all 10,000, had beautiful illustrated letterheads. But you know, the truth is, most did not have any letterhead at all. Uh, it was just a simple page. And uh, some of the most important letters in our local history are written on simple pages. And then you have letterheads that are just the most basic ones, like this one, for example. But even the simplest letterhead has a lot of history. This one, if you look at the top, but at the very top, it says Lacey and Forrest. That's O period, C period Lacey, and H L Forrest, the lawyers. And what's interesting, I'm sure Forrest was a very interesting man, but what gets my interest is O C Lacey. He's the man that Lacey is named for. And he is the most mysterious person you can you can imagine. We know hardly anything about this guy. The, the community that's now Lacey used to be known as Woodland back in the day, named after the Isaac Wood pioneer family. Uh, they wanted a post office. They uh, sent an application to the federal government for a post office called Woodland. And the government, I, I can't say promptly, but they did reply. And they said, no way. There's another town in, in, Thurston, in, in Washington State called Woodland down in Clark County. And back in the day, the, when they send a letter, you would send the name and the town. There's no street address. So all the letters between the two woodlands would get mixed up. So they said, no, you can't have Woodland, Washington as your name. So they sent one in, another one, in, and was accepted in June 1891 called Lacey. Lacey, Washington, and it's named for O.C. Lacey. Some people believe, and the best historians on this are Lanny Weaver and Aaron Quinn Valcho from Lacey. They believe that his name might have been his middle name who went by Chester. But O.C. Lacey was a lawyer, um, justice of the peace, real estate speculator from Olympia, and I would add a con man too. Um, <laughs> and somehow, they turned the name in Lacey, and they accepted it. And um, so the thing is, um, uh, the post office became known as Lacey, and the rest of the town was, was, was Woodland. Well, the funny thing is, no one knows any connection between O.C. Lacey and the community. There's no evident connection. The only thing I can think of is that by the person turning in the application might have owed them money. I don't know. There's no reason. Uh, the, soon after this letter, in 1893, the economic panic struck this area, ser seriously affecting all the people here. And O.C. Lacey was seriously affected. He, he abandoned his wife. He left this area for Seattle, Spokane, and then, as they say, parts unknown. We don't know what happened to him. But eventually, so you had... In, in the community, Lacey Post Office, everything else is Woodland, and then eventually it's all Lacey. But I think this little, he this little uh, letterhead has a lot of history to it. And this one is, is chose to change. It's, a, it's what you call a billhead. A billhead is an invoice or bill that a company sends out. It's very closely related to the letterhead. And uh, this is a billhead from St. Martin's College. Of course, it's St. Martin's University now. 
uh, the Catholic school out in Lacey. And if you look up at the top, it's Woodland, comma, Lacey Post Office, and Woodland's crossed out. They, they're, they're going completely to the name of Lacey. So even the simple letterheads have a lot of history. But today, I'm going to focus on the really more colorful ones. Okay. And one thing, particularly in the 1870s, 1880s, um, uh, 18, before the 1890s, when letterheads were done, um, before they really had illustrations, one way they made them kind of snazzy was to use very elegant printing fonts, different types. And this is James Hoare, who was a prominent businessman in Olympia, even mayor for a time. So I have to admit, when I look at the list of mayors of Olympia, back in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, 1900, they change every year. And there's two ways of looking at it. Either it was a very difficult job, and they can only last one year, or it was more honorary one that they just exchanged through time. Anyway, this is Hoare's letter, and uh, it's just very elegant how it's uh, put together. Now, sometimes when you see a letterhead, the illustration is very simple, but it's right to the point. One look at this, and you say, this guy sells automobiles. No, no, I'm wrong. <laughs> this guy sells boots, shoes. He sells shoes and boots. Um, and it's George Vincent, and actually his father sold boots too, and we'll see a letterhead by him later. But it's right to the point, it's very effective. Um, this one is a simple letterhead, but there's a lot of stories behind this one. Um, it's a letter from if I can say it correctly, Russell G. O'Brien. And he was an inhabitant of Olympia and was actually the first leader, and some people call him the father of the Washington National Guard. And this is his official letterhead. And uh, there is the territorial seal, because this is written five months before Washington became a state. And um, O'Brien is a real character. and. Um, St. Patrick's Day is coming up soon. He was truly a, a true Irish American. And he was famous for singing uh, in public, publicly, no, not just on the street, at different programs he would sing at. And um, he was the first man to sing the famous pioneer song, The Old Sattler. And you say, well, what's The Old Sattler? Think of Ivor's Acres of Clams, the song associated with that restaurant. He was the first one to sing when it was brand new. Um, <laughs> Also, and this, this claim to fame is a little hard to prove, but he was one of the first to promote people to stand up for the national anthem. Now, I think there was people across the country doing this, but here in the Northwest, when they played the national anthem, he would stand up and he inspired other people to do it. Now, this one's a little more fancy. But for the town of Bacolda, the little town south of Tonino, this company was everything. Um, think of the relationship between Tumwater and the Olympia Brewery Company. It was the same for Bacolda and the Mutual Lumber Company. Um, when it was in business, like in the 1920s, Bacolda had the nickname, the little town with a million dollar payroll. And they even had the slogan across on a banner across the, you know, the street coming into Bacolda. When the company went out of business for three years in the Great Depression, 1930 to 1933, the town crumbled. It came back to work, uh, reduced scale, and kept through to about 1946. When it closed, um, Bacolda never really recovered, actually. It shows the, the change from industry to other forms of the, the economy. This one is not very interesting on the front. But one type of letterhead I like particularly are the ones that on the back there's something. And there were a number of letters that, that, that had that. And on this one, they had this whole sheet of information. It's all about Olympia. Uh, you can express it 
in one phrase, you can do better in Olympia. But I'm going to read part of it because some of it, I mean, the parts that says, oh, we have a grist mill, we have a, a saw mill, mm, that's interesting. But I like the more funny parts. This is about the weather. Olympia has an ideal climate, the most temperate of Puget Sound. Violent storms are unknown. Winters are mild. Hmm. Okay. And an excessive heat in summer is never experienced. And this is the line I like. The death rate is the lowest in the state. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't think there's any science or facts behind that, but Okay, here's another one of those double double sided. And um, this one is basically, oh, the one thing I thought was funny too, they had this slogan on the front. And in the, in the little red circle, it says, get involved in Olympia, stick, or stick to Olympia, work for Olympia. But if you look at the symbol like I did, I first thought the slogan was, get stick work. <laughs> and I go, what does that mean? But no, you're supposed to look in the middle. <laughs> Okay. Olympia, Pearl of Puget Sound. An equitable, delightful climate. 365 comfortable days in every year. <laughs> Never a zero day. Nights always comfortable, cool. No blizzards, hurricanes, or thunderstorms. Abundant artesian well water for the drilling. Fine city water supply. I gotta move there. <laughs> Um, sometimes they had on the back of some, not locally, but statewide, very interesting local maps. But the, the, I couldn't find any for Thurston County. But sometimes they had photographs. And this is the Hercules Sandstone Company in Tenino. Uh There's a series of sandstone companies. The Tenino Sandstone Company is one. Hercules is at the west end of the town. Of course, they're basically closed down. This one's open just a little bit. And they have this photograph. And it's uh, people admiring this giant piece of sandstone. And the part that gets me, it's only one inch thick. OK, now, sandstone was like really important for Tenaino. If you go down to the main street of Tenaino and you walk down there, all the buildings are made of sandstone. Um, it's one of those industries that was really big early in the 20th century, and then Concrete comes in, uh, brick comes in, steel comes in, um, and they're much more practical and, and co less costly. And so cut stone for buildings went way down. Now I'm really happy to say that sandstone carving in, in Tonino is not dead. Uh, Keith Phillips, who I think spo has spoken here, and other stone carvers, his, his co-workers, have kept the tradition alive because to me, Tonino is sandstone. Okay. I'm going to show some, I, I call them gems of Thurston County illustrated letterheads. And these are more colorful. These have more decorative design to them. Um, this one is uh, Pulley and Huggins in Bacolda. Uh, they were a store in, in, in the 1890s. And uh, I, reading from what they sold, they sold everything, you know. Um, they, they groceries, uh, dry goods, farming equipment, logging equipment, anything you want. Um, I remember seeing this letterhead when the late Roger Easton gave a talk down at State Archives many, many years ago. And when I saw this letterhead, that was one of the inspirations. I said, you know, there might be something in these letterheads. Rayback's Music Store. Now, the story behind this one is Eamon's Rayback. I think was the most persistent, determined businessman I've ever seen in Olympia history. The poor guy comes to Olympia, and all he wants to do is to have a music store. But he doesn't have the money or anything to, that he could do it. So what he did was he worked in a sawmill. And so he worked in a sawmill at nighttime, I mean daytime, and then at the nighttime and weekends, he opens up in the shack on the left this little tiny music store. 
uh, sell pianos, organs, mu sheet music, instruments, all types of instruments. And he does pretty good at it. And he finally gets successful enough that he can give up his sawmill job and he opens up the store on the right. But that's not the end. His whole life is it's all along Fourth Avenue. Bigger and bigger stores. It's amazing. Pretty soon it's like five times the size of the one on the right. Um, his, what's interesting, the store's not gone in a way. Uh, his family, he, he died. His family sold the, ran the store for a bit, and then in 1946, sold it to the Yinny family. And then it becomes the Yinny Music Store, which is now up on the west side that still is a Yinny Music Store. Okay, this is one kindly supplied by Don Trasper, and it's the Tumwater Club. Uh, I, it's really an elegant design for it. Uh, the Tumwater Club was up on Capitol Boulevard, close to the Limpy Brewery Company, and it was built in 1908. It was used, uh, the, the company built it for the use of the um, uh, off hours use of their workers. But what really makes this building unique was its polished wooden floor used for dancing. And they must have had a million dancers there. And uh, they had, in World War I, uh, Red Cross dances. They had legislative balls were held, uh, held there. Uh, governor's inaugural balls were held there. It was really a, a, a community center. I'm not quite sure why they picked a, a, a Native American lithic tool. But anyway, it's very nice. This is one that uh, how, you all know about Olympia High School. This was the first Olympia High School, located on the, what was now the state capitol campus near the Sunken Garden. And it was built in 1907 and uh, didn't last too long. Uh, it burned July 1st, 1918, pretty much to the ground. I think some walls were standing. And then they moved uh, across the way to the second high school and then 1961 to the current site. Um, but what's interesting about the building is that um, if you look very carefully, it says Miller High School. It doesn't say Olympia High School. Now, for people who are long-term residents of here or went to Olympia High School, my wife and my daughter and I have all graduated from Olympia High School. There's a secret to it. We all call Olympia High School, but the real name for it is William Winlock Miller High School. That's the legal name. And what, they, what happened was they needed land for the school, and the widow of Winlock, William Winlock Miller gave them the land in the beginning. And the, her husband was a high territorial official. Uh, I would like to say he was a noble man. He was a great man. Man, he was one of the worst people I've ever read about. <laughs> he was terrible. Uh, and uh, I'm surprised he wasn't shot or something. But um, anyway, he was rich. And he married his wife, who was like half his age. He dies. She inherits millions, you know. She moves to Seattle, but she gives this land very kindly and generously to the school district. But the provisional, what, the provision that the school will always be known as William Winlock Miller. And so when, when my wife and I went back to, went, went to the school in the 1970s, um, uh, they, t they still called it that sometimes. But nowadays, like when my daughter went to it, they have a, a, a plan. What you do on the front in big letters is Olympia High School. And they refer to Olympia High School all the time. But then if you go to the back side of it, there's a big sign, William Winlock Miller High School. <laughs> and they never refer to it that. So they kept the legal name but they gone to the common name, Olympia High School. This is the Buckeye Extract Company. And it was founded in 1903, actually in the basement of the founder's home. And it was a company that made all types of spices and extracts and uh, baking powder, all types of things you could do for baking and cooking, and even cleaning too. And um, it existed up into the 1950s. Uh, what's interesting for me on this one is the, the symbol and the name, Buckeye. And uh, it comes from the fact that John Stintz uh, was from Ohio. 
the Buckeye State. And it's named for the Buckeye tree that I learned while doing research. The, the nut, the nut, we can see a nut there. It looks like the eye of a deer, so it's called a Buckeye. And um, the, uh, so he named it for his, 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 home, his home. And the other thing that's interesting is sometimes we think women were not involved in business. Oftentimes they were. Uh, the secretary on the right, far right, that's the wife of John. It's Birdie Stents. So she was a full partner in this company. And I don't know how successful the company was. I, I've read that they had salesmen all through the Pacific Northwest selling things. Uh, but the one thing I do know is if you ever go to an antique shop, you will certainly see a Buckeye Extract Company glass bottle. They must have made millions of bottles. And there's still a lot of them floating around. This is an interesting letterhead. It's actually from a billhead. And this store stood at, um, down at 7th and Adams in downtown Olympia. They had this beautiful historical marker there that is pro was promptly vandalized. And I wish they could replace it because you can't really read the story. And it was a store, sold everything, like a lot of the stores. But the most interesting part of the history is what came later. Uh, well, after it was a store, it was used for a whole bunch of things. A uh, armory, a ballroom, lots of stuff. But the most notorious thing is in 1903, the old territorial wooden capitol building is not good enough for the state, for the state legislature. They can't meet in the old capitol. The new capitol, which is what he called the old state capitol, has not been Fi fixed up for the legislature. They needed to add a wing to it. Then it became the home of the state legislature. So they had to find a temporary location. They picked this building. So imagine the, the state legislature meeting in this old store. The people in Olympia were kind of ashamed, but they were okay with it. But people from other cities like Seattle, Tacoma, Spokane, they called it the barn. And they, they, it was a low, very low point for Olympia as, a, as the state capital. But it only lasted one session. This one, the steamer Mitzpah, um, I like the name. Um, it was part of the Mosquito Fleet. And you have to think that in the, in the older, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, the easiest way to go places is not by land. Maybe the railroad is pretty good, but the best way really to go is by water. And so there's this whole fleet, and they called it the Mosquito Fleet because if you, they, they said there were so many boats going around, it looks like mosquitoes over the sound. And this was one of the smaller ones, 55 feet long. Uh, it was, uh, uh, went into operation in 1905, and um, uh, it went from Olympia to, to Kamachi. Now, you can say that, they, you know, goes there and comes back, but of course they stopped at every little house along the way. And um, the, the, the part I found interesting about this ship was that in 1915, so only 10 years later, it burned to the water line. Now, in those days, I don't think they just threw it away. What they did was they rebuilt it as a tugboat. And it actually lasted as a tugboat up until 1960, it's believed. This is uh, um, the Olympia Door Company. Um, all these areas in Thurston County were famous for the industry, and the, the sawmills, the different mills were crucial. This was a very important mill. Uh, uh, it was owned by C.H. Uh, Springer, um, and he's an interesting character. Uh, if you ever go to the South Capitol neighborhood, one of the nicest houses there, I think on 17th Avenue on the corner, uh, is this large white house now. It used to be might be yellow now. Anyway, um, it's, it's a really nice house. Built in 1917, that's his house. Um, the interesting thing is he didn't just stay in mills. He became the founder, the guiding light, 
the president for umpteen years of the Olympia Savings and Loan Company. And then that becomes Olympia Federal Savings. I mean, I think he was president for like 50 years. I mean, he was just the man for the company. Uh, Edward Langham, we'll talk more about him later, did the drawing on the left. Now we're going to come to probably the most important industry in Tumwater, where we're at. And that's the Olympia Brewing Company. And uh, the Smith House Archives has a wonderful collection of letterheads uh, mixed in with all well, the correspondence and stuff. Now, it, when Leopold Smith comes from Montana, he, when he first comes to Tumwater, the company he founds in 1896 is not Olympia Brewing Company. It's called Capital Brewing Company. And here you can see a, a drawing of it, that the letterhead for it. And it's a nice elaborate one. And then in 1902, it's renamed Olympia Brewing Company. And the part I like to particularly to note is the logo, which is in the first one, but this one is up front. You can see it. And it, of course, the Lucky Horseshoe and the Tum Water Falls. Things did not always go smoothly for the Smith family. And in 1916, when prohibition in Washington State came in, um, they, uh, uh, they had to go out of the beer business. And so one thing they did was to produce this Northwest Fruit Products, and it included, it was really juice, fruit juices. Um, and you can see the Loganberry and the apple juice. Uh, did it do very well? Well, no. <laughs> uh, it lasted a couple years after World War I ended in 1918, it quickly faded. Now, if the Smith family put all their money into this, that would be kind of sad. But no, they put most of their money into hotels, a whole chain of hotels, and into the transportation business of bus lines. And they were very successful in that. If you look to the far left, that one building, that's the old brew house here in Tumwater. It's kind of faint, though. Now, after prohibition ended in the 1933, the brewery reopens. They go back to their letterhead. You see that, that logo again, Tumwater Falls and the Lucky uh, Horseshoe. Okay. Through time, many governments have had letterhead. Uh, I would like to say the letterhead was always fascinating and great, and, but of course they weren't. Uh, but this one is really interesting. It's the Thurston County uh, government and um, back in 1892, and it features their beautiful building, their courthouse, that opened in 1892. Um, it must have cost a fortune to do it. And um, unfortunately for them, the depression, the panic of 1893 came right after that, and they simply couldn't afford this building. So they sold it to the state, and the state added a wing and it became what we call, you know, the old state capital. And um, it uh, was the capital to 1928, and then they moved to the current capital campus. Now, if you look at this bu the building, you see a lot of turrets. Most of those were lost in the 1949 earthquake, but what you especially see is the beautiful clock tower right in the middle. And that really was a landmark um, in, in for the city. It was a landmark for the city. And they um, uh, had eight, eight sides to it. In 1928, there was an electrical fire that destroyed much of the building, but it was rebuilt. But the clock tower was not structurally safe, and they had to take it down. And at the time, state government said, we promise, the people of Olympia were very upset about this, we promise we will put that tower up again. They never did. <laughs> Some of the most interesting or prominent letterheads, you know, highlights buildings like what, what, what we just saw. This is a, a prominent building in downtown Olympia, the Chambers Building, and uh, it still stands at Fourth and and um, and State. No, at, no, at Fourth and Capital Way. Excuse me, Fourth and Capital Way. And what's interesting is that the store here is I Harris and Sons, and that's Isaac Harris and his two sons. Um, Mitch, Mitchell, and Gus. 
and they own a dry goods store. But what's, what I find interesting, and this is really a nice letterhead, but the, the store went on for a long time, and they became famous not for this building, but for the Harris Dry Goods Building, which still stands on Capitol, well, at Capitol Way. I, I kind of remember that building because it's right downtown, and it's like every time I go downtown, it's a different business in it now. <laughs> but they were in there for a long time. Oh, okay. This is the Temple of Justice where the Washington State Supreme Court meets on the state capitol campus. And there is probably an architectural drawing of it, uh, 1913. It opened in 1913. It was not complete at all. It did not have the, the, the stone work on the facades. When it opened, it was brick. Even inside, it was not finished. Uh, the, the government was very reluctant to pay money for this building. And so it took to 1920 to finish it. And they really never quite finish it. If you look on the front, in the front step, there's a place where there's two statues. And I, I've talked with some of the people that worked there, and they really would like to have those statues. But they've never come. Now, the story about this one I like the most, though, is uh, Justice Alexander um, once said that he was at a meeting of justices uh, across the country. And um, uh, he, he met the, one of the justices, Supreme Court justices from New York State. And the guy said, you know, Justice Alexander, I, I make twice the money you make. But I would give up half of it to work in a building called the Temple of Justice. <laughs> it has kind of a ring to it. <laughs> this is from the Brown Farm um, out in the Nisqually Delta. It's hard to picture, it's a wildlife refuge now, but for many years, uh, from the turn of the century, earlier actually, uh, until well in the 30s, 40s, 50s, it was a farm. And I have to admit, uh, the, this letter is a, is a good example of Shuspa. Most of the letters I've read, uh, particularly the ones that were sent to the governors, were basically hire me, uh, basically hire my friend, or someone has a job and he should be fired. But, but this one is more interesting. He's, they're writing the governor and said, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up, Thanksgiving Day, buy a turkey from us. Um, what's interesting about the Brown Farm is that to create the farm, they created all these dikes out there. And, if, and these dikes have been taken down to, create the, to recreate the natural estuary. So when you go out there now, probably the only real sign of the Brown Farm are what they call the twin barns. They still stand. This, was, this is one of my favorite letterheads. I saw this and I go, I, I have to have this one. Uh, Knox Auto Service. Um, it shows the popularity of automobiles um, in the early 20th century. One thing interesting about this group too is be besides selling auto supplies and all that uh, and, and fixing cars and stuff, they also ran an early bus system down to Tonino, over to Shelton and stuff. And uh, it went on for some time, and then they stopped during the Depression. But if you look at it, I like all the different designs on it. And particularly the one about the can, Zero Lean. And it got my interest, what type of oil is this? And so I looked it up, and it was produced by the Standard Oil Company in the early 20th century. And it was called Zero Lean because it still flowed at the temperature of zero. And its it symbol was the polar bear. And uh, they don't make it anymore. It's been replaced. This is an intriguing one uh, from the, the Smith House collection. And it's the Tumwater Ready Cut Homes. Uh, the Anderson brothers, and I don't know how many brothers there were, at least five or six or seven or eight or nine. They, they came over from Sweden and they set up this mill and this company that they sold um, prepackaged supplies to build a house. They also sold the plans for the house and then people would build the house, their house. And it sounds kind of crazy, it's, it would be a kit house. Uh, but hundreds were sold around here. And it's believed, I've heard even one estimate of 500, which seems kind of high, but uh, hundreds were sold in Olympia, Lacey, and Tumwater. Very successful company. 
This is one from the heart of the Depression, um, the Capital City Creamery, uh, 1935. Um, and during that time, the Capital City Creamery sold milk, ice cream, butter, even ice. But what caught my eye was this little kind of very matter-of-fact letter, and they showed those are types of ice cream they're selling. Now, when we, well, 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 at least when I buy ice cream, it's in a bucket. <laughs> but back in the day, sometimes, and my daughter has done some research on this, sometimes the ice cream was sold in kind of like a slab with a design imprinted on it. And ice cream was eaten by the slice. But the, what, these are different. They're kind of for special occasions. Obviously, that ice cream shaped like a turkey. I'm thinking Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know? And uh, so each holiday would have its different ice cream shape. This one is from the Smith House Archives, too, and it's the Port of Olympia, you know, founded in 1922. And I like the design on it, but what impressed me on this was every type of marking that was put on this letter. It's incredible. When it came to the Olympia Brewery Company, they, there's a little note written. Uh, they have that little symbol from the original letterhead. They had a receive stamp, and then they had everyone who was supposed to look at checked off their name. I mean, this letter was well received, I guess. <laughs> and then, I know letterhead in recent years have, have faded off, the honest truth. But this one kind of caught my eye, and it's from Jason Matson, who really knows Yardbird history. He's the director down at the Lewis County Historical Museum in Chehalis. And um, he kindly provided this to me. Um, the Yardbirds were, were founded in 1946, first Centralia, then Chehalis. And they were, they were in Chehalis. And they started as a war surplus store. Then they moved up, and they had, a, they had another branch they formed in Olympia in 1959 known as uh, Seamart. Okay, I, I see some people remember Seymour, and then that became Yardbirds later. I have to admit, I have lots of memories of Seymour. Um, it was the craziest store. They had war surplus stuff, army uniforms and supplies, up for decades after the World War II. And then also, it had the biggest toy department in the city. But the one thing I remember, I, I, can, I can almost smell it now. When you walk into Seymour, you could smell popcorn, because <laughs> they gave us free popcorn. Boy, they have a lot of popcorn. But the beautiful murals were painted over. Seamart was renamed Yardbirds of Olympia, and it closed in 1993. And then a few years later, Chehalis closed, too. It's more complicated down there, but it closed in the 90s, too. Now, the thing about letterhead is that there are many very interesting letterhead. But to me, some of the best ones done here locally was done by the master artist, Edward Lang. Uh, he was here between 1889 to his death in 1912, a German immigrant, German-American. Uh, I believe he was a friend of Leopold Smith. He did a lot of business with the brewery company. Uh, he did a lot of letterhead. He traveled through the whole state, too. A lot of his work is all different parts of Washington. Uh, this is one letterhead he did of um, Percival Dock, built in 1860, redone many times, now it's Percival Landing. But you ever want to see an image of the Mosquito Fleet, this is it. You see all lined up, all the steamboats lined up. Um, the, the late Gordon Newell, who was probably the master historian of Maritime Olympia, uh, he really liked this emblem, and almost every publication he did, he, he had it included. Lang traveled around. This is a letterhead he did for the Tonino Sandstone Company. Um, two things I want to note about it. It's just how detailed it is, one thing, but that's the third thing. But one thing is the sandstone quarry. You can still see it. And in fact, you can get a real close look at it if you have a swimsuit, because it's the swimming pool in Tonino. And they have all sorts of legends and stuff on what's in the bottom. You know, is it, you know, sandstone cutting equipment? Is it, you know, the bodies of, no, anyway. No, it's a, <laughs> uh, but it's a nice a swimming pool. Very cold, though. Um, on the right, 
The other thing I was going to point out, those are the sandstone, professional sandstone carvers. Many of them are, are European uh, immigrants, they're like Scots, come over. It was a highly, this is not cutting from the quarry, this is the detail work. They're highly qualified, skilled artists. I think Ralph Monroe's uh, grandfather was, was one of them, but he, did, he worked more on the up north. But the thing is, when they worked, they did not wear, you know, um, typical workman clothes. They dressed up for the occasion. Um, they wore top hats. They wore, I, I wouldn't call them suits, but white shirts and stuff. They really dressed up to do it. Uh, I remember when Keith Phillips talked about that, I think he dressed up like that. You know, it's amazing. These guys are working at carving stone and they're dressing up for it. Um, also in Tenino, this is the T.J. McClellan store. And it's a little hard to see. It's a, it's a dry goods store in the 1890s. And um, the, it, it's hard to see, but it's people getting clothing. Buying clothing. There's some very well dressed men there, and also women and children. Um, when I first came across the name T.J. McClellan, I go, who, who the heck is him? But then, luckily, um, looking at different Tenino histories, it turns out that McClellan was a very enterprising individual. He later went and formed a drugstore that was uh, in Tenino for a long time. He owned a movie theater. He owned the first power company there and the first telephone company. So he was a, a major business pillar of Tenino. This is uh, the Hotel Olympia. But let's get a bigger picture of it. There we go. I think this is one of the masterpieces by Lang. Um, the Hotel Olympia is sistered kind of across from Sylvester Park where the old federal building is. I think they call it the Dolliver Building now. Um, it was built in 1890. It was magnificent. It was like the pride of Olympia. It burned in 1904. Real loss to the people. Um, the, the part I like about this is all the detail. Um, you see the, the, the trolley system going by. You also see uh, a little kind of uh, wagon carrying people to the hotel. And then Lang used his imagination and you look in the back and you see beautiful Olympic mountains. I don't think they've ever looked quite that clear. <laughs> this, this illustration, this letterhead by, by Edward Lang, um, 1893, uh, I think shows the relationship between Olympia and the water. Um, Olympia started as a port, as a maritime city, and in some ways it still is. Nowadays, a lot of times I hear you know, sea level rise. But really, the, it's much more, the relationship between Olympia and the water is much more complicated than that. And here you can see the activity. Now, Lang was a, wanted to draw optimism. And so this is probably the busiest day Olympia port, you know, has ever seen. The one that gets me on the most, though, is on the right, it looks like this combined raft. And I don't know if one ever existed, but Lang certainly liked that. He drew an M. Now, in the corners are what we call vignettes. Uh, the one is an ad, and the other one is the proposed Capitol building. That's the 1893 flag one that they never really built. This one is another Lang drawing, and it's looking way high up, looking north. Olympia's, downtown Olympia's in the middle, east side's to the right, west side's to the left. Tumwater is back, back this way. Um, th what, what I find interesting about this one is that when Olympia celebrated its 150th anniversary of incorporation in 2008, they decided to use a letterhead again. And they wanted a really fancy one. So they used this design, which I thought was kind of cool. Now, the thing is, um, this is a very simple one. And um, this guy, Benjamin and Vincent, was the father of the other Vincent who had the, the boot. But if you look on the back, I think this is one of the most fantastic uh, letterheads I've ever come across. And uh, it's boosting the town. 
and it's the 1893 bird's eye view of Olympia. You're looking to the east, that's Mount Rainier in the background, quite bigger than it really is. Um, so you're looking to downtown Olympia, and then the east side, and the front is the west side. Tumwater, if you follow the water all the way, Bud Inlet, is back there on the, on the right side. And of course in those days, there's no dam at Fifth Avenue, there's no Capitol Lake, and the, the water flows freely. Bud Inlet goes all the way up to, to the brewery of that time, to Tumwater. One thing Lang did I always thought was kind of fun too, was that if, he, if a building was important, he made it bigger than it really was. <laughs> so you can pick out the big, the big buildings there. Okay. Um, here's one of the vignettes. This is the, the flag design that was never built. Um, letterheads. Nowadays they've been replaced to a good extent. Letters have been replaced. And uh, I would say it's email, it's other forms of electronic um, communication. But in archives, in libraries, in museum collections, private collections, there's still many old historic letterheads, illustrated letterheads that are preserved. And I think they're wonderful historical resources. They, they, they can entertain us. They can teach us about the past, and they're definitely worth, worthy of preservation. So I encourage people who have interesting historical letterheads to take care of them, and at the minimal, do a scan of them to preserve them so they're not lost in case they, they're destroyed. And so um, I just want to conclude, and, and thank you for coming today. Oh, okay, sure. And one thing I should mention, I did, I did bring, I, I did bring copies of my Edward Lang book here. And if anyone's interested in buying any, I have the special price of twenty dollars each. And my my family right here will be selling them in, in the back. And I'd be glad to sign them too. <laughs> so I'd be glad to take any questions too. Yes. On the one letterhead, there was a red crown on the oh, yeah. side. Was that a British crown, or? I would say that would be a trademark. Was that the car ad, or? I think so. Yes, yeah, I think it's a trademark for a specific oil product. So it's for a company. It would not be, um, it would not be the British crown. No. Yes. My family has a story about a boat in the Mosquito Fleet. Yeah. And I've tried to find reference to that boat, and I can't. Can I? Do you have any suggestions about how to pursue yeah. my interest in finding yeah. out about it? What I would do is, um, uh, the truth is, I would go to the Washington State Library, which is actually pretty close to here. It's on Israel Road. And um, I would go there and look at some of the maritime books. And there are some really good ones. Um, maritime history, and they're indexed and stuff. And I would look in the indexes and look for the name of that boat. I think that's the best way. Yes? I have a question about a historical mystery in my backyard. Um, wondering where I could find information about their cement blocks with names on them. And they, I live in a historic home. It was built in the early 20s. And curious where I could find information about what they're from. OK. It, um, do they, is it like the names of one family or the names of different people? Individual people. And there's no dates associated with it. What I would do for that is I would go to the Washington State Archives and I would have the, 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 the parcel number for your house and then do a little bit on the history of the house and to find out who owned it through time. And then there might be some connections with the names that you're finding back there.